Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Joliet. I'm Pastor Bo, and as I always say, it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you into this sacred place. The, the scriptures say, wherever two or three are gathered together, the, the Lord himself is present. So it is my prayer today that you will feel God's presence as we worship together in this time through music, through prayers, through the, uh, through the reading and listening of the word of God. May God bless you. I want to share with you a little bit about ministry and what's going on here at First Press. One of the first things I want to mention is um, this past Sunday, our youth group went out for uh, a little outing uh, and uh, they went bowling. And the stories that I hear about their time together are amazing. They had good food, fellowship, and, and, and just a good time together uh, bowling and getting to know each other. So if you have a youth or you know somebody that is looking for that connection, uh, I will invite you to stop by and talk to Lindsay and have a little time of um, get to know you and see what this ministry for the youth is all about. When it comes to kids also, we're getting ready for uh, spring and summer activity already. I know it's just uh, February, but the summer will be here pretty soon. So we're talking Ekhan Vacation Bible School and uh, kids music, different other things. If you want to go to the website or to our Facebook page, you might find more information about those kind of things. So definitely give it, uh, give it a try and, and uh, even uh, subscribe to the electronic e-news uh, newsletter that comes out every Wednesday. Also, I want to say uh, today uh, you will see uh, Pastor Roy uh, giving the message and it is his last Sunday with us before he retires retires again and uh, I, I pray that uh, uh, the Lord will be with him and we thank him for his ministry among us and uh, um, as I said may the Lord bl uh, bless him and if you want to drop a line and say thank you I will appreciate that too with that being said let us come to the heart of worship let us come to the heart of God for this time that we have together. And um, I want to encourage you with these words. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created all the things that we see as nature. He created man and woman. He created the people that he loved and breathed his own breath into them. And the best thing that that can capture the relationship between God and, and people and the creation is that God walked with these people every morning. So let us walk with God as we are together in this time. Let me pray. Lord, we do ask your blessing. We ask that you will walk with us, talk to us. Help us, Lord, to see your goodness, to see your grace. Uh, in your name we pray, amen. Let us worship. The Lord is with you. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come. I come Just 
just as I am, thou wilt receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. I come just as I am thy love unknown has broken every barrier down now to be thine yea thine alone first lesson today is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 4, and beginning with verse 13 through 25. Uh, faith and law come into uh, contrast with one another. Hear the word of the Lord. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of, of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was a hundred years old, or when he considered the uh, barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words that was reckoned to him were written not just for his sake, but also for ours too. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everybody. I'm Lindsay, and it's time for our children's sermon. I've got a question for you before we get started. Have you ever been given a nickname by someone? A lot of the nicknames that I've been given have been a lot of variations of my first name, like just shortening it to Linz, or even Linzaya by one of my friends. Others have been a lot more random, and maybe yours have been too by your friends or your family. One of my friends used to call me Elmo for some reason. Another would call me Bob from VeggieTales. Uh, she went by Larry, so, you know, kind of a duo sort of thing. 
One even called me Merida because of my hair after the movie Brave came out. Nicknames can be really fun, especially if they've been given to you by someone who knows you really well and who you know really cares about you. But did you know that God has lots of nicknames in the Bible? Throughout the Bible, we see God refer to himself by lots of different names. And we see God's people give names to God that describes different parts of his character. One of the first names that we see is the name El Shaddai. Can you say that with me? El Shaddai. El Shaddai means God Almighty. And we see God refer to himself this way in Genesis chapter 17. And this is while he's making a promise to Abraham. And this is revealing to Abraham part of who God is. One of the most well-known nicknames actually comes later in the Gospels when we see Jesus referring to himself by lots of different nicknames as well. In John chapter 10, he refers to himself as the Good Shepherd. And Jesus is using this name to describe his relationship with us, his sheep. This tells us a lot about who he is, that he's loving, caring, and that he looks after each of us and provides for us. Just like how nicknames can tell us a lot about each other, the different names of God can tell us a lot about who he is. And the cool thing is, God really wants us to know him. When we get to know him more and more, the deeper our friendship with him becomes. We're gonna go ahead and pray together and ask God to help us continue to get to know him more and more every day. Why don't you go ahead and pray with me. You can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving me and for knowing me. Help me to get to know you more and more every day. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you guys next week.
Our second lesson to us comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 24 through 30. Uh, this is when Jesus was giving his pronouncements at the temple, and he was talking about the Good Shepherd. Hear the word of the Lord. So the religious folks gathered around Jesus and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep, hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hands. The Father and I are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace be with you. Grace and peace. Uh, this passage of scripture is usually reserved for the uh, third Sunday after Easter uh, in year C. Uh, and you'll find that every year that if we're following the lectionary, the third Sunday after Easter or the fourth Sunday in Easter uh, is uh, the Shepherd Sunday. And we end up with the 23rd Psalm, uh, John 10th chapter uh, of the stories of shepherds throughout scripture and reminds us of how Jesus is our shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. And I think that that brings great peace to all of us. Uh, this is my last Sunday with you and uh, uh, as uh, your transitional pastor. And I've had a, a gracious, wonderful time with you. And we've tackled many issues as well as, as just loved on each other and had a great, wonderful time. And your uh, ministries will continue in my prayers and the success of this congregation and its ministry to the community around us as well as uh, to the ends of the earth in many ways, uh, I will continue to hold in my heart. And, uh, and I cherish many, many of you as uh, dear, dear friends and uh, of where we've shared many times together. Uh, I'll miss the staff and I thank them for how they've supported and worked together. And uh, I, uh, Want you to know that I admire them and think the world of them too. I made five promises to you. I don't know if you remember them or not. The first one was that I would I would preach God's word, and every Sunday you would get some truth out of that, so you could go back and look at that scripture. The second one was that I, I don't I'm not a psychic. So I don't know if I'm supposed to visit the hospital if you don't tell me, or if you tell me when I ask you, do you want me to come and you say no, then I assume that that's the truth. And I, I just, that's the way it is. Uh, the third thing is that I promised you that I would forget anything you told me verbally on Sunday. Um, and, uh, but if you wanted me to remember it, write it down and give it to me. Now I must admit, I've broken that promise a few times because I actually did remember a few things, but, I always make that promise just in case to protect myself. The fourth thing was that I would make mistakes and I've made mistakes and that I would ask for forgiveness and I've done that. And you've been very gracious in those times when uh, I've called you or contacted you and we had those conversations. Uh, the last one was that I would love you. And I do definitely love the uh, this church and I love you, the members that make this church. And uh, I thank God for you and what is happening in this place. Jesus, as he talked to his disciples and to those who believed in him, was caught between a time of transition. The transition was the transition of, of Israel recognizing Jesus as Messiah or the folks there in, in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, you'll notice that I changed one word in the beginning where it says, in, because it says in scripture, that Jesus talked to the Jews, but you have to be really careful in John because as that transition where Christianity finds itself uh, in uh, a, a new identity over and against the Jewish tradition or over with the Jewish tradition and within the whole government and the world of the Mediterranean 
uh, sea area at that time. Uh, Christians were being kicked out of Jewish synagogues and in that uh, as this was being written by, by John the Apostle. And uh, there's a clarification between the two groups and it was a very important time of transition. Jesus, so when John writes about Jesus and he's talking about the Jews in the Gospel of John, most of the time you can say, you could probably translate that the religious folk or the religious traditionalists, if you wish, because Jesus wasn't really angry at the Jews, but he was angry at those who were unable to accept new uh, beliefs that were in the system itself. And systems have a way of holding back change and, and working against uh, new experiences in the spirit within the community of faith. So that's why I translate that from Jews to the religious people. Jesus says he's with them. They're having these struggles of trying to understand who he is. They say, you know, why don't you just tell us that you're, that you're the Messiah? And Jesus says, I've already shown it to you. And if you believe, it's because you believe. And if you don't believe, it's because you've chosen not to believe and, or what's been in front of you. And then he says, you know, my sheep, right? Believe in me and I know them and they know my voice and they follow me. Those three things are really important parts. First of all, that, that we know who the Lord is. My sheep know me, that, that knowing you, knowing him and belong to him is part of who we are when we allow the savior to hold the image of God within our very hearts and lives in his hands. You see, our Lord takes, he doesn't take selfish possession of us. He takes wholehearted, loving, guiding direction within our lives. He helps us to find out who we really are, who we were created to be. And allowing ourselves to say yes to God allows God to work through our lives and for us to be his instruments in this world. I find that to be a great blessing. I find it to be a great hope. I find it to be a wonderful promise in my life. The second thing is that we hear his voice. That means when the Lord calls us, we respond. Now, there are all kinds of stories in the Bible about people who hear the voice of the Lord and who run the other direction. And we can list those people throughout scripture in the Old Testament and the New Testament but the bottom line is that the Lord will continue to speak to us uh, if there's something in our hearts and our lives and our experiences and our attitude towards life that we continue to stay disconnected with or out of sync with, then the Lord will keep talking to us until we finally come to a point where we repent and we get our act together. We ask him to help us get our act together but we face who we really are. It's pretty tough to face who we really are. And uh, I encourage you to, to, in prayer, visit with the Lord and ask the Lord to speak to you and, and help you in, in your life as I ask him to do in my life too, because we all need that all the time. Uh, I have often told many of my, my friends, uh, Dr. Phil Anderson, who was my uh, hospital, chaplain, a lead chaplain, and, and I spent a week with him every week uh, for two years uh, in counseling with him. And then we also had small groups and signed readings and we talked about our visits on the different hospital floors. And I remember talking to Phil and said, Phil, I, I really, I really want to know myself because that's, that's, that's how we live in this life when we really grasp who we are. And I remember Phil, who I'd given permission to uh, joke with me, be straight with me, and, and that just simply said, Roy, I think that's overrated. <laughs> and so I, I, I realized that maybe in finding myself, I would have to allow the Lord to really change me and change myself and not be so impressed with myself as a young man at the time. Uh, I thank God for Phil Anderson and how God put him in my life to uh, 
allow me to laugh at myself and to allow me to recognize that God isn't finished with me yet and that uh, the Lord really does want to work through me. You see, I do know the Lord and the Lord speaks to me. Sometimes I close my ears or my eyes or my heart, but he's constantly doing that. And that's how we know that the Lord really does love us and that we really do love him. The third part is that we not only hear the Lord's voice, but we follow him. Following the Lord is so very, very important. I mean, that's why Jesus came in flesh in the first place, to show us how to live, to show us how to, to deal with all the different winds of our times, the difficulties of our times, the joyous times that we have with one another, uh, how to support each other, how to hold each other, how to love each other, how to be there for one another. That was one of the great, phenomenal things that happened in the early church because they loved each other so much and they really did take care of each other. I mean, look at the way they took care of the widows and food and things like that. This church does that too, through the deacons and through other ministries. And I really thank the Lord for that heart within this church. And I encourage you to nurture that on, on, on many levels. But we follow him. Uh, we could say that the Christian life is one of discipleship, but we could say followship too, to follow what the Lord shows us about life. Uh, that would change many of our answers to questions. That would change many of our uh, dispositions when dealing with people. Uh, and, you know, I have as many people that I have rubs with that anyone else does, but I really pray that the Lord helps me in those difficult situations, in those times in my heart. Uh, we follow the Lord when we belong to him, when we listen to him. Lastly, I think that the really important thing to me out of all of this uh, is that Jesus says that the Father has given us to him and we are in his hand. And then he says, the father can give you to me because you're where you are in his hand. And so we're in the hands of the savior. We're in the hands of God, the father. But then notice he said, the father and I are one. Now that really upset the religious people in that day and time because that meant Jesus was God and they didn't like that. If you need a passage of scripture, it says that the early church believed Jesus was God. Just go right here to John the 10th chapter and you can find it. That holding and caring for us is, is just so important. Uh, I remember when I was eight years old and uh, the whole family uh, drove from uh, El Paso, as far west in Texas as you go. And we decided to take a, a drive and we went to Big Bend uh, National Park, the southernmost part of Texas. And we uh, drove there, or at least the southernmost part in West Texas. And we drove there, and then we went to a mountain that we climbed up. And we were going up this mountain, and I was just tired. And I remember my dad reached down, and I reached up, and he took me and swung me around and put me on his shoulders. And my dad carried me all the way to the top of that not huge mountain, but it seemed like as an eight year old and took me all the way down because I knew that I was being cared for by my father. He was holding me. His hands were so powerful to me. His presence was powerful to me. His love, his demonstration of love to me and his care for me and for all of us kids and for mom too was just amazing how, how he truly was in love for us and with us because the Lord had called him into this position within our family. But I remember how safe I always felt with him all the time, very, very safe. And when the Savior says we're in his hand, that means he's caring for us and we are safe within him. But that doesn't mean we're not gonna have hard times or not have illness or uh, not have tough financial times, all kinds of things. No, it means that he is holding us and he is with us. We are not alone. 
and he holds our hearts and holds our lives because he gives us eternal life. You know, uh, when I was a kid, I, I sang in the, the booster band, which would be equivalent to a children's choir. Uh, and one of the songs we used to sing was Safe Am I. Safe am I, safe am I in the hollow of his hand, sheltered or sheltered or with his love forevermore. It was a wonderful song and it had several verses, but I remember that feeling that my parents led me to and that the churches my dad pastored and I was present in led me to feeling safe, cared for, loved, a part of, not a part from, but a part of with the body of Christ. My prayer for you, my prayer for all of us is that we continue to seek the Lord, that we continue to know him, that we continue to hear him, and that we continue to follow him for the Lord has given us everything we need to be safe in his heart, in his life, in this life, and the life to come. Amen. Why should I feel And I
prayers of the people is such an important um, part of our worship. And uh, this week I, I participated in a seminar uh, that uh, dealt with uh, Christian counseling and how we deal with trauma, how we deal with, uh, with things that come into our lives, uh, especially in ministry. And one of the things that I was reminded was how important it is to listen to people, how important it is to observe, to, to, to be a presence, a welcoming presence to people so they can share their lives. And I know that sometimes that is very hard. And um, I found myself saying a, a, uh, at one point, uh, you know, even if you don't know, that I'm praying for you, I'll be praying for you. If I observe something in your life, a time of stress, a time of um, great angst, I will pray for you. So I want to encourage you in this time to think about some of the people in your life that might be going through those things and listen to what God has uh, put in your heart to pray for them and to do so. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we do ask that you will come into our lives again. We ask that you will come and give us uh, the joy of your salvation, the assurance of your peace and comfort, the assurance that you are present with, with your creation, not just with us, that you are present in our world. Even though we see so much evil, even though we see so much destruction, even if we see the creation itself breaking down because of what we have done as people. I pray that you will still be present with us and we can still see you at work. So Lord, give us insight on how to deal with our lives, of how to make better decisions. Give us insight and leading uh, minds, leading thoughts that will help heal from our relationship with each other to our relationship with you. Help us heal in the relationships we have with our neighbors, with the people that are seeking for you. Help us heal, Lord, our communities. And Lord, we do pray that your healing will stretch out. Especially today, Lord, I pray for the people that you put in our mind, people that are struggling, people that are trying to figure life and they need help. I pray that uh, first you will speak to them in your own way. I pray for your comfort, peace, for your embrace of love to be theirs on this day. And I pray for us, for each one of us to, to be able to see them to be able to walk alongside, to encourage, and to build up. So Lord, I pray that our hearts will be transformed by your love so we can love in the way you want us to love. And Lord, as we look into the week ahead of us, we ask for your peace, for your provision, for your guidance along the way. So be with us, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen, amen.
this past week, if you listened uh, to the sermon last week, uh, uh, I was thinking about um, blessings. You know, there's this whole hymn that says, count your blessings, name them one by one. And I found it very interesting when you, when you look at what's happening right now in, in terms of certain um, research that says you cannot be anxious and be grateful at the same time, you know, that apparently there is a part of your brain, the brain is responsible for that and says that if you are anxious, you cannot be grateful, but if you're grateful, then you cannot be anxious. And, and, and I'm thinking of uh, uh, what Jesus said, you know, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow it will worry itself about itself. And uh, in all things, give thanks unto the Lord and bring your prayers with supplication and ask from God that he will take care of things. And as I think about all these things, putting them in, in this perspective of the vision that we have for this year in terms of a ministry, you know, to count our blessing and name them one by one, from the way we live our lives to the way we are part of with each other in this ministry to the, to the way we give of ourselves. How nice and how empowering it is for us to have a thankful heart. So as we come to a time of giving, I want to encourage you to count your blessings, name them one by one, and respond with a grateful heart before God. If you are here for the first time, uh, I will encourage you to take a look at our website and, uh, and see what we are about. Find that uh, um, Be With Us button, and, uh, donate or ask for more information from the uh, church office or come and be here with us in person and, and see what this congregation is about, what this ministry is about. And you'll, you'll hear these words a lot in this space, give of yourself, of your time, of your talent and your treasure, and may God bless you. Let us pray together. Lord, everything we are is because of who you are, so we put ourselves into your hand. Go before us and guide us, protect us, and help us to serve you, Lord, with the best that we have. In your name we pray, amen, amen.